Halo, 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 selamat siang semuanya yang living members di mana saja berada dari Sabang sampai Merauke tentunya. Ketemu lagi dengan saya Indri Melani yang hari ini akan mengawal sesi kedua virtual farm dan berdasarkan feedback di sesi pertama kemarin bersama Nicola Slendel, coba kita connecting sebentar. Jadi Di selasa lalu, Nicholas bercerita tentang bagaimana tahapan mulai dari menanam, mengembang biakan, memelihara, memaintain lavender, sampai kemudian dipanen dan kemudian proses destilasi berlangsung, akhirnya dibotolkan dan digunakan oleh semua oilers di seluruh dunia. Nah, hari ini kita akan menyambung sesi kita dengan Nicholas dengan sesuatu yang lebih 
natural, sesuatu yang lebih menyentuh. Dan kalau saya boleh tanya teman-teman semua di rumah, kalau di Utah, yang udah pernah ke Utah, itu di sana sekarang jam berapa ya? Tengah malam ya? Nah, seseorang yang luar biasa di saat tengah malam waktu Yuta, saat ini sudah menunggu kita semua live untuk menunjukkan pusat destilasi kita di Mona Farm. Ada wow nggak? Ada tepuk tangan dulu nggak untuk kita semua? Oke, okay? jadi uh, supaya kita berjalan lancar nantinya, saya ada beberapa pesan. Jadi komen akan kita off sepanjang acara, baik di Zoom maupun di Youtube. Kemudian bagi yang ingin bertanya, nanti bisa raise hand. Tim audio visual kita akan spotlight kameranya. So, bagi yang ingin bertanya dan sudah raise hand, pastikan kameranya nanti on semua. Kemudian bagi yang ingin bertanya juga, pastikan nanti tidak kemana-mana. Jadi ketika sudah di spotlight, sudah ready untuk nanti bertanya dengan seseorang yang luar biasa hari ini yang akan kita panggil. Nah, Kemudian bagi yang menggunakan dua device, ya, jadi mungkin rame-rame, nobar di rumah, salah satu device-nya mohon volumenya di off -kan, demi kualitas yang baik untuk Zoom kita hari ini. Oke, siapakah yang akan menemani virtual farm session kita hari ini? Simak video berikut ini. Hi, David Little, the agronomist from our global farm. Semua boleh say hi to David? Yeah, thank you. In the middle of night, Utah time, you are already in our distillation center and bring something fresh for our member here in Indonesia. So David, our St. Mary's Lavender Farm and Distillery is where everything is started. So... Would you please introduce three yourself first? Very good. It is an honor for me to be here. And I'm so glad that I can participate in this event with you. As agronomist of Global Farms, I have the honor to be able to work with all of our farm managers and the field workers behind the scenes to be able to develop our organic farming practices and make sure that all the field standards are met at all of our farms. Before we continue, I have to give credit, because while I am the voice sometimes of Young Living, and I'm able to present many of our farming practices, it is really the farm manager, the field worker, those that are cultivating the crops that deserve all of the credit because that's who, get it, who is getting the work So a huge honor and respect to our staff and all who are working behind the scenes. Look forward to taking you on a tour today of the Mona Farm. Yes, we feel great that and feel wonderful also for your sacrifice to go to the farm in the middle of the night just for to show us the Mona Farm and the Selection Center. So, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Mona Farm started from 200 acres in the beginning? Correct. And how many acres so at this actually, moment? Actually, so right now, the Young Living Farm in Mona is just over 1,400 acres. Wow. Wow. Oke, okay. uh, ada big wow nggak? Jadi dari 80 hektar sekarang udah sekitar 1.400 hektar something Mona Farm kita itu, ya. Yeah. Dan di sana ada lavender, juniper, ada Melissa, Clary Sage for the plants that have been planting there. So before we are going to the question and answer, uh, ladies and gentlemen at home or everywhere. 
we would like to play a video that David Little has been presented to us. Welcome to Young Living Farms. My name is David Little. I'm an agronomist at Global Farms. And I'd like to take you on a tour today of the Mona Farm here at Young Living and be able to share with you some of the regenerative organic practices that we use at our farms. Right this way, we're at the Mona Farm greenhouse. And behind me are 150,000 green starts of goldenrod. Where do these come from and why do we care? Well, let me show you. Have you ever wondered why it is that Young Living Essential Oils are the most effective of any essential oils on the market? It all starts right here. This is a bottle that we store our seed in, non-GMO pure seed. Now, every plant has multiple species, and of those species, multiple subspecies. Young Living takes special care to study out the specific species and subspecies of plant that can provide the proper genetic expression of essential oils to have all of the constituents so that it's effective to work with our body and support natural wellness. In this jar, I have a little over 3 million goldenrod seeds. Those goldenrod seeds are then planted into trays like the ones behind me. And we're able to grow these little starts that then get transplanted into the field to produce the natural essential oils, pure and simple. Once those seeds come into our, our greenhouse and we study them and test them, they have to go through a rigorous testing process so that we can ensure that they're the proper genetics and can provide the proper genetic expression of essential oils. Walk with me this way into our other greenhouse. Behind me are about 250,000 lavender starts. These starts will be planted to the field. And here I have some lavender seed. Again, this is hand harvested from our own fields to ensure that we have just the right genetic expression of essential oils. When it's time to harvest for the production of essential oil, we save our best plants back and allow them to go to seed. And then we harvest that seed to bring it in and be able to plant our crop for the next year. Let's jump on the buggy and head over to the blue yarrow field. While we're driving over to the Blue Yarrow Field, I would like to share with you some fun facts about Young Living Farms. Right now, Young Living owns nine corporate farms, and we also work together with 14 partner farms and numerous certified seal, seed to seal suppliers that all follow our rigorous seed to seal standards. As part of the seed to seal standard, Young Living has a rigorous list of regenerative organic farming practices that we have to use at all of our farms. Now bear in mind that every farm is different. Right now we are at the farm in Mona, Utah. It's a very arid region, high elevation of 5,000 feet. And so only certain crops will grow well here. But then if we, and so here at Mona, we have a very specific set of insects and weeds that we have to deal with as pests. If we go to our farm in Ecuador, that's a tropical region. A lot more rainfall and moisture, very humid. So a very specific species and types of plants grow in Ecuador. Then we go to our farm in France different climate, different environment. 
and then to our farm in Croatia and Tabiona and Canada and all over the world where we have our farms, very different climate, very different environment. And so with those different environments and climates, we have different insects, different weeds, different challenges at each farm. And so the regenerative organic practices that we use at each farm are very different, very specific to that farm and what its challenges are. We use regenerative organic practices, including cover crops, organic fertilizers like compost and mulch, amendments of, orga of organic microbes. We also use beneficial insects like butterflies and brain mantises. And in Ecuador, it's a different set of insects that we use that are predatory insects on the insects that like to eat our plants. For weed control, we use weed burning and manual weeding. We also use inter-row cover crops. A lot of different regenerative organic practices. And we'll talk some more about those in a few minutes. But right now, we're just entering our blue yarrow field. And I wanna, I wanna share with you an experience that I had with Gary Young right here in the same Blue Yarrow film. About three years ago, when I studied as a farm manager under Gary Young, I had the honor and privilege to be his apprentice. And he would take me through the fields and teach me about the production of aromatic plants and why we have to use regenerative organic practices in order for those plants to reach their highest potential. So we'd be walking along during, during our stroll through the field and, and away we go. And all of a sudden I would lose Gary and, and I would, next thing I knew I would find him on his knees. And he would be right in the middle of a plant, smelling the plant and he would study the soil around the plant. And the next thing I knew is he would dig up a plant. Now this is blue yarrow and blue yarrow is a perennial crop and it's a very shallow rooted crop. And I wanna see what we find as we study these roots and study the soil. And Gary would pull it up and as a farm manager he would say, what do you notice? And so I ask you the same question, what do you notice? We have a lot of fine fibrous roots, which is an indication of good crop health. And we should have about as much root mass below ground as we have biomass above ground. All these fine fibrous, the, the smaller roots are the feeder roots. They exude or kick out chelates and acids into the soil that release the nutrients the plant needs and brings it back into the plant. Let's see what else we can find here as we dig in the soil. One of the cool things that we'll find is all of the soil structure. Notice that the roots are woven down into the soil and all of those clods and soil structure enable air and roots to grow down through the clods. And what we can't see are a myriad of microbiology, beneficial bacteria, amoebas, protozoa, nematodes, flatulates, all working together in mycorrhizal fungi down in the soil. And what are they? They're the caretakers of the plant. We have a living soil with this microbiology. So how do we achieve that? How do we achieve a living soil? Well, it comes in two parts. The first part is that when we rotate our crops, we put on about 10 to 20 ton per acre of organic compost and mulch. Then we come behind that with a multi-species cover crop. Eight different species of plants, each with a specific purpose to fix nitrogen, to put organic matter back into the soil, to break up hard packed soils with a deep rooting crop. And so each plant in that selection has its purpose. When we plow that cover crop under as a green manure, we're able to put back another six ton per acre of biomass, put back into the soil as a green manure. All of that organic carbon 
from the compost and the cover crop and the living roots in the soil provide the microbiology food and life to grow, some place to live, something to eat. And then we also repopulate beneficial bacteria and mycorrhizal fungi and, and we put those out into the field. And when we do that, they're able to break down that organic carbon and feed the plant in a form that the plant can use it in the form of enzymes, amino acids and proteins instead of individual ions. And so what's great about organic farming is we're, be able, we're able to provide to the plant the food and nutrients that it needs in the form that it can use it in. So I wanna take a minute and replant this plant. Bear with me. And I'd like to go have you come with me over to our beehives. We talked a little bit about integrated pest management and the, important, and the importance of using natural biological systems to manage our pests. Let's go there now. All right, one of the things about integrated pest management, here we are at our beehives. And here at the farm in Mona, we actually have three different locations throughout the farm where we place beehives. Bees are one of the numerous beneficial insects that we use as they are able to help us with pollinating all of our, all of our crops. And it's just a wonderful thing. The bees, uh, without bees, our lives would end as we know it. So we love bees. Uh, and one of the things, I don't want to get too close because I'm not suited up, but each of these bees know right we're a region of up to three miles to bring nectar back to their hive on another occasion hopefully we can get more into bees because they're very very interesting also right here what i have we're gonna i'm gonna have you walk with me out into the blue yarrow field again as i want to release some of these beneficial insects in this particular cup, what I have are the larvae and eggs of praying mantises. So in one of these little egg sacs, there are between 100 and 200 praying mantises. And all we have to do is, is to place these praying mantis egg sacs out into the crop. And as we nest the praying mantis nest down in the body of in between two plants, those praying mantises will hatch and raise up and they eat the aphids and some small beetles and white flies and make it so that the little bugs that chew on our leaves and eat our crop and harm the crop, it doesn't cure the problem 100% but it keeps it in a manageable condition so that we can harvest a good healthy crop. Let me place one more praying mantis sack. I place it down deep in the plant like that to protect it in the cold environment at night. We're still in the springtime here, and so down in the body of the plant, we'll protect it from predators uh, so that those praying mantises can hatch and, and grow up. I also have right here a number of ladybugs. You guessed it. And as those ladybugs fly away, these ladybugs also are predatory insects. And instead of eating our plants, these ladybugs that are flying away, and they'll, they'll help protect our crop right here, again, from aphids and white flies and other soft body insects that chew on the leaves of our plants. So I'm gonna go ahead and release the rest of these ladybugs right out in, in our row. And so all of these ladybugs that you can see right, right here getting ready to go, in time, they'll take flight and they'll move to other areas in the crop and eventually they'll spread out across the crop, 
looking for aphids, white flies, other soft body insects, and help us to preserve a naturally healthy crop for the production of essential oils. At this point, I wanna take you back over to our show row where we're doing some research on some additional regenerative organic practices. And as we go head over there, uh, we'll be able to take a look at some different cover crops, inner row cover crops, and other ways that we use livestock in regenerative organic practices. So let's head over there now. As we get ready to go over to our research row so I can show you some more regenerative organic practices, I want to run a little test. So far today we've been talking a little bit of farmer English. And so, ahora quiero hablar en español. Tal vez me entienden, tal vez no me entienden. Or what if I speak in Chinese? Ni hao ma, o jali dawi, ni de di en wa hao wa sedu shao. If I speak in Chinese or English or Spanish, those languages don't understand one another. Moreover, some of the words in Spanish and some of the words in Chinese don't translate to English. My body, your body, does not speak synthetic. Okay, so as we talk about all of these organic, naturally sustainable farming practices, I want you to kind of connect the dots here. Why is that important? My body doesn't speak synthetic, your body doesn't speak synthetic. So when I rub some cream on my body or take some synthetic product internally, my body doesn't know how to use that. It's a foreign material. So some of it just passes out the back end when I go to the bathroom. Some of it gets hung up and causes side effects. And of course, my body's pretty amazing. And so it figures out how to use some of that to my benefit. Well, the same thing with the plant. The plant is not synthetic either. It's natural, it's biological. So I don't know who it was back in 1906 that discovered that they could manufacture synthetic nitrogen and synthetic fertilizer and put it on the crop. I'm gonna put $50, $50 worth of nitrogen on my field and get $100 of crop back. Oh, cha-ching-ching, -ching. it all became about money. But you're killing my soil. All of these chemicals that they're making and synthetic fertilizers to spray the weeds and the bugs and to put synthetic fertilizer on the soil, you're killing my mac microbiology. All those little microbes that are the caregivers to the plant, that feed the plant, in the form the plant knows how to use it. Amino acids, enzymes, proteins, plant food in the form the plant knows how to use. So the plant doesn't have to create those building blocks. It can just go to work and grow and reach its highest potential. So right now we're just arriving at our research row. Right here, what I want to show you, I'm standing in the corner of, of a muddy field, but if we we'll look down here, this is mustard caliente. So this spring, we wanted to plant a cover crop that could help us to suppress weeds, to reduce disease-borne pathogens, and to be able to put organic matter back in the soil. Guess what? Mustard caliente has the ability to do all of that. So we planted this early spring and in about one month's time, this will grow up and this mustard caliente crop will be about waist high, two to three feet tall. When we plow that under as a green manure and then immediately plow it into the ground and irrigate it to seal the soil, it releases a natural fumigant of a cyanide gas that is able to neutralize or sterilize the weed seed. So we get reduced weed growth. It also sterilizes pathogens. So we get reduced soil-borne pathogens and fungus and diseases in the soil. It also helps us to put back about eight ton per acre 
of organic matter into the soil to feed our crops. This is an amazing thing and a big part of our regenerative organics. Walk with me this way as we come across the road to an inter-row cover crop. First of all, behind me, you might see some sheep that are grazing on this inter-row cover crop. The sheep are used as part of our regenerative organic process. And when they eat the grass and the clover that's in our inner row cover crop and poop it out the back end on the ground, here, walk with me for just a second. See what we notice right here. As a farmer, you might think, oh, as a general person, you might think, oh, poop. But guess what? As a farmer, I get pretty excited about this because the sheep, they eat the biomass, the organic matter, and it comes into their stomach. And inside their stomach, it joins with all of the microbiology, the microbes, the beneficial bacteria, the enzymes, and then they poop it out together with the organic matter and it breaks down and feeds the plant. So these sheep are much more than just mowing the grass. They're fertilizing weed eaters. So they come through and they weed our lavender. They're not particular, they don't particularly like the lavender, so they leave it alone. And many of our aromatic plants are not favorable to the sheep as a palatable forage. And so they leave our aromatic plants alone and they eat the weeds, the inner row cover crops, and leave the bacteria inoculated organic matter as a very powerful fertilizer in our fields. Very cool. So right here behind me, the study we're doing is on more efficient irrigation systems. Drip irrigation on lavender with a permanent weed barrier that can keep back the weeds, enable us to grow a pure healthy crop. When it's time to harvest this lavender, we then come through and mow the grass and clover, and then we can harvest only the lavender that gets distilled in our distillery. As we talk about regenerative organics and all of the things that we do, you might, you might wonder why is it that we do this? Why, why does it matter? I want to share one more Gary experience with you. I had been here at the Young Living Farm for about three months when Gary and I rode back to the farm in the evening. And as we were riding back to the farm, I, I was just contemplating how big Young Living is. The fact that we're worldwide and how big of an empire Gary had built. And I commented to Gary, I said, Gary, this is amazing this empire that you've built with Young Living. And he just shook his head. And he said, David, it's not about the empire. It's about the one. Everything that we do at Young Living is about people. It's about creating an opportunity for one mom or one son, one daughter to be able to have more quality time together because we're able to provide them with nature's living energy essential oils. You see at Young Living, our vision is a healthy home for each of us and a healthy world for all of us. And that was Gary's vision. And that's why we go to the lengths that we go to provide regenerative organic farming practices that can produce therapeutic grade essential oils that can relieve a little bit of stress, that can help my natural wellness. Now I'm not saying the essential oils are gonna cure all the diseases of mankind, it's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that I have the ability naturally to support my body's functions so that it can be as well as it can be naturally. And that's why, why we do what we do here at Young Living. Thank you. Wow, that's really touch and feel wonderful when we hear from you, David, about what is the reason behind Gary built her farm empire. And 
I'm very sure that all of us from here, our member from here in Indonesia, get so many, many more valuable information for them for enrichment and for you know sharing the good ones, sharing the oils and sharing the information about seed to seal and organic practice. So, uh, seperti yang kita tahu teman-teman di rumah, Mona Farm itu dibangun dari awal di sebuah tanah yang tidak pernah tersentuh pestisida ataupun pupuk buatan kimiawi. Seperti yang tadi kita saksikan di video barusan, semuanya diupayakan menggunakan makhluk hidup baik itu hewan ataupun tumbuhan yang memberikan manfaat sedemikian rupa sehingga makin kesini kita semakin yakin bukan bahwa setiap essential oil enggak sama dan enggak pernah sama jika praktek-praktek metode tanam yang dilakukan sangat berbeda. Semakin jelas sekarang ya perbedaannya. So, it's time for question and answer now guys. Bagi yang ingin bertanya boleh raise hand. Pastikan kameranya on sehingga nanti tim audiovisual kita bisa memilih teman-teman dan men-spotlight videonya. So, who is the first? Oh, oh, we, we have, have Ibu Andina with us, us Dewi. Please, Ibu Andina. Hi, Hi Dewi. Hello. Yeah, uh, I'm really amazed with your explanation, and I I miss coming back there. <laughs> In uh, 2019, I um I went uh, to Silver Retreat with with my uplines and my sister lines and um. Uh, you know, it's speechless to see with my own eyes that uh, the mono form and the distillation and everything. But I want to ask uh, ask uh, to you is uh, how do you feel working with young living, and what is the best moment and the hardest moment when you work there? It is an honor for me to work with Young Living, and I've always loved agriculture since I was a little boy, and so working on the farm is definitely in my heart, but what really brings me passion is the purpose behind Young Living, that everything that we do at Young Living is all about people. It's about you and about me, and I would say the hardest thing that I do at Young Living Really, there's nothing that's hard because I'm so passionate about what we do. Sometimes there are challenges like finding a natural insect or a natural means to combat predatory insects or to combat weeds. And so that's a big challenge that I have is to find natural means to grow our crops healthily in a healthy manner and naturally and sustainably. Luckily, I have fantastic farm managers and field staff that help to accomplish that goal. So as we come up against challenges in our business and in working at the farm, we have to come back to that root passion, to the core in our heart as to why we're doing what we're doing. What is your why? And I think about my why, and that's what gives me passion to be able to overcome any challenges. Okay, thank you, David, for your answer. I guess Ibu Andina is still with us at this moment, but uh, maybe her signal is getting freezed. Thank you, Ibu Andina. So we would like to go to the next question. Please. Hai Ibu. Silakan bertanya kepada David. I cannot hear the question. Ibu, mohon oh. maaf suaranya tidak bisa didengar oleh Hello. saya dan David. We can hear Hello. you. Oke, okay. okay. silakan. Dengaran enggak Bu Indri? 
Sudah kedengaran Ibu? Silakan. halo uh, David. Halo. Halo. Uh, David, I want to ask uh, about is the compost in the farm affected with the season change? Okay, I want to repeat the question to make sure I understand it correctly. The question is... Uh, the is compo the uh, compost uh, and uh, another uh, another ingredient in the farm affected with the season change. Yes, very much so. Um, in the winter time, it gets very cold down to zero degrees Celsius or even below zero. And at that cold temperature, when it's frozen, the microbiology goes deep into the soil. And the organic matter is unable to break down because everything is frozen. Some of the seed that we plant has to go through that freezing period in order to germinate. For example, stage will not germinate unless it's frozen, goes through a cold period. Uh, realize that all of our farms are very unique, but here at Mona, that's, that's the way it goes. So the cold temperatures are both beneficial and challenging at the same time. Okay. Hey. Thank you, hey. David, for answering. Uh, uh, one question, Ken? Okay, okay, sure, please. Uh, is the plan in the Utah uh, on an, another farm is a uh, harvest in the same time and in the same batch? Will a uh, distillation moment? Okay. Some some plants can be grown at multiple farms. For example, we produce lavender in Mona and we produce lavender in France. We also produce lavender at the St. Mary's farm in Northern Idaho. At each of these farms, the climate is just a little bit different. And so harvest timing is a little bit different. Each farm is unique. However, once the crop is harvested, the distillation methods are all the same in terms of the temperature, pressure, and amount of steam, the duration of time that that essential oil has to be distilled. Okay, David, if I may say from different uh from different location and different season, we will have different ways to distillate and different time also. Correct. Yep. Okay, Bu, masih ada lagi yang ingin ditanyakan? Udah, Bu Indri, terima kasih. Thanks, terima David. Terima kasih. Thank, Thank you, you for asking the question. Yes. So, let's go to the next. Bagi yang sudah raise hand, silakan kameranya di on kan supaya kenal sama Mas David. Hai Ibu, dengan siapa ini? Halo. Hai Ibu. Hai, is... it's nice to see you and yes, I would like to ask a question uh, about interest about the fertilizer, especially from the animal. So, guys, in the animal, there in a specific or a special place. And are you guys have a breed, also the natural predator, like you say? I did not understand the question completely. Boleh tolong diulang, Ibu, pertanyaannya? Sepertinya putus-putus diterima oleh David. Oh, ya, yeah. oke. Okay. I want to ask the question about the 
perfect time. So, Ibu, do you want to so ask about the fertilizer? Yes. yes. And about the... Yeah, about the fertilizer. You said you have a natural predator. Uh, did you get the natural predator in a special place in the... Ibu would like to ask you about the fertilizer that have been using in our farm generally, I guess, and then about uh. the natural predator that have been used also to protect our plants in the farm. Okay. okay. So the fertilizer that we use, before we can manage, we have to measure what we manage. So we test the soil to understand exactly the nutrient con content in the soil. And then we're able to manage how much mulch, how much organic matter, how much compost, and what other supporting organic fertilizer we need to meet the crop needs. Each plant that we grow has a different nutrient requirement, right? And so every farm, every field, every crop is unique. And, it, and that's why the farm manager and the field staff are so critical to being able to accomplish that. Realizing that every farm is unique, each farm has different insects and different pests that we have to manage. So the beneficial insects that we use in Mona, the ladybugs and the praying mantises, is different than the beneficial insects that we use in Ecuador or the beneficial insects that we use in France. Every farm is unique. And so first we have to study and identify what are the local pests that we're dealing with and then search for the predatory insects that can combat that challenge. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's, that's very cool, you know. So uh, as the agronomist, you have to check you have to research first which kind of insect or predator that more suitable for every farm so it's gonna different yes yeah. thank, you. thank you so much for your hard work so we get essential oil in here in India. yeah thank you so much thank you yeah thank you thank you david thank you ibu and hopefully what David, David tell us about the natural fertilizer, the natural predator, it's, you know, enrich our knowledge about how it goes the oil come from the farm to our home. Okay, we are still having one more. Hi, Ibu. I can't see you face clearly. But please, you can ask David anything related to the farm. Thank you, Ms. Henry. Thank you, Mr. David. Uh, sorry, in my English is a uh, little, little, <laughs> uh, not fluently in English. Uh, but I want to ask about uh, in Indonesia, there is uh, many uh, oil. Uh, like uh, tanah, uh, I want to ask about uh, is it possible for young living to open uh, lavender or patch coli farming in Indonesia if the soil in Indonesia meets the requirements such as Geryong? Very uh, possibly. So okay, that is okay. a fantastic question. We receive inquiries from all over the world. Can you farm here? And can you farm there? And right now, we're doing a full review and study of the demand and supply of Young Living Essential Oils, where we're growing our crops and what the demands are. And as we reach a point that we need more of a given crop, then we'll search for an area where that crop can be grown. For example, if we need to uh, supply more peppermint oil, 
Then we take a look at the peppermint plant. Where in the world does that plant grow the best? And then we start to search for farms in that area where we can expand and grow additional peppermint essential oil. And so as we look at the different crops and the different plants that we need in terms of a demand and sourcing our oils for our Young Living members, there may be some plants that grow very, very well in Indonesia, in which case we would certainly consider that in evaluating the opportunity of new farms. When that would actually happen and, and whether it would be in Indonesia, I don't know yet, but we certainly want to consider all opportunities. Yes, very true. So at this moment, Ibu, Mona Farm itu adalah the biggest distillation center in the world, well, as far as I, I know, uh, David. David. So, so maybe, maybe sekarang masih sama. mencukupi dan kita nggak pernah tahu uh. jika itu memungkinkan, tapi mungkin membutuhkan beberapa penyesuaian. Uh, we need some adjustment maybe if we would like to do so, David. Uh, I'm pretty sure about it. Do you still have a question, Ibu, for David? Uh, enough, Miss Indri. Okay, thank, thank you very you so much, much, Mr. David. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Sudah bertanya, Ibu, dan bagi yang sudah raise hands, please open your camera on so we could spotlight your video for the next question. Yes, dengan Ibu siapa ini? Hello, Bu Indri and David. Saya dengan Lucky dari Pontianak. West Borneo. Silakan. Hello. Oke. Okay. Apakah sudah terdengar? Sangat jelas, Ibu. Silakan ya. Oke. Okay. Uh, the question is uh, about climate change uh, in in Indonesia, especially uh, in global climate change. Uh, is a global issue uh, in Indonesia. Uh, the climate change uh, affect unpredictable climate can uh, can affect crop failure. Um, the question is, how about in the mono farm? Is climate change has affected plants, and how your living face it? Thank you. Okay, That's a great question. For you, Every David, year please. is very difficult because the climate is very, very cold and then very warm during the summertime. The climate changes every year. We live in a very arid region, and sometimes we don't get very much rain. Other years, we get more rain. Sometimes the temperature is is not as hot. Other times it's hotter. So from one year to the next, we can expect variation in the amount of essential oil that is produced by the plants and even the timing when we might harvest the essential oil. How we make sure that we have the highest quality of essential oil is we have to test before we harvest. So as we're approaching harvest planting, some years when it's really dry and really hot, we will harvest our lavender in the month, in the middle of the month of June. Other years when it's cooler and we get more rain, then we don't harvest the lavender until the beginning of July. So it depends on the development of the plant. And we have to test. Each year we have to test before we harvest to make sure that all of the constituents are present to make a full-bodied essential oil. And so while we do have climate changes that affect the development of the plant and affect the development of the essential oil, we test before we harvest and before we distill to make sure that all of the constituents that are needed to make that full body essential oil 
are present and then we harvest and then we distill and we confirm that with testing after we've harvested and distilled the essential oil. Thank you, David. Ibu masih ada yang ingin ditanyakan? Do you still have any question? Thank you, David. Uh, the, apa namanya, yang living quality statement is very good. And I salute for, the, for yang living. Thank you, Mas David Thank and Bu Yeah, yeah. Aku merinding ya. Yeah. Uh, I got ghost bump when she said thank you for you for your uh, sacrifice struggling on the field to make sure we get the best essential oil in the world. So thank you Ibu for asking question dan bagi uh, penanya berikutnya siap-siap silakan raise hand dulu tapi saya punya informasi uh, yang menarik. So David, you can you can take a break one or two minutes before I announce some challenge for our members okay thank you so berbeda dengan sesi sebelumnya di mana kita punya kuis maka untuk sesi bersama David Little hari ini kita punya challenge yang berbeda silakan di summarize tadi dari awal sampai barusan sharingnya David tiga hal yang paling menarik yang bisa kita sampaikan, kita sharing kepada tim kita, teman-teman kita dari apa yang sudah disajikan hari ini. Tiga hal yang paling menarik sehingga post itu di Instagram feed-nya masing-masing. Kemudian uh, tag YLID underscore education, tag juga yang living underscore Indonesia maksimal hingga Sabtu 20 Februari jam 23.59 tentunya ada hadiahnya apa itu? 3 peppermint 15 ml untuk 3 pemenang ya pastikan kontennya menarik taruhnya di feed kemudian selain YLID underscore education ataupun yang living underscore Indonesia mungkin Kakak-kakak leader semua punya seseorang yang membutuhkan informasinya, boleh di-tag juga. Catat tanggalnya maksimal hingga Sabtu 20 Februari jam 23.59. Oke, okay. bagaimana rasanya setelah kita mendengar tanya jawab yang setengah jalan berlangsung ataupun materi yang sudah disampaikan langsung oleh David Little dari Mona Farm Utah. Ada yang belum ke sana, makin pengen ke sana enggak? Atau yang sudah ke sana, pengen ke sana lagi tadi seperti Bu Andina. Acokan jempolnya bagi yang pengen ke sana. Yeay, ada banyak yang mau pengen ke sana. Oke, okay. uh, apakah sudah ada penanya berikutnya? Baik, jangan lupa kameranya di on, supaya teman-teman audiovisual kita bisa langsung men-spotlight videonya kakak-kakak sekalian. Here we go, David. Halo Ibu, Ibu Mora, are you with us? Aha, sinyalnya tadi free sebentar ya. Silakan Ibu Mora. Ibu Mora mohon maaf, suaranya tidak terdengar. Hai David, hai Ibu Indri. Halo. Um, uh, one question. Um, I'm wondering if there's um, any possible if someday one of the plan will be run out, maybe because of the major. And what if that happened? What is the precaution action that Young Living will do? Ibu Mora? Ibu Indri? Yes, tadi nge-freeze sebentar. Boleh Ibu diulang Ibu. pertanyaan? Can you repeat it for David again? Um, just wondering if there's any possibility if one of the plants will be run out. If one, sorry, I don't understand. If one of the plants do what? 
if one of the plants someday it will rinse out or wow. because yeah yeah that's a great question that is one of the reasons that a key part of seed to seal is sustainability we have to make sure that what we're producing today can not only be produced tomorrow but it can be produced in an increased volume in a more natural the most natural way possible for years and years and years to come one of the responsibilities that i have and it's not just me it's an entire team we have a seed to seal business organization led by Corey Howd, Brett Packer, and Chris Packer, who their focus is on ensuring the long-term sustainable supply of Young Living essential oils. And we continually evaluate our demand, how much is being produced at each of our farms, and plan ahead to make sure that we have enough production to meet our demand. We have a certified seed bank because without the seed, there is no plant. So we have a certified seed bank where we store seed so that we can continue to expand and grow as needed. So in order to meet that demand and ensure that we don't run out of a plant, it takes very careful planning and very careful management to ensure long-term sustainable growth of Young Living Essential Oils. Very interesting, David. Ibu Mora, do you still have any question? No, and I feel so relieved knowing that the Young Living is already prepared and thinking for the long term for us uh, to, um, to feel and to use the Young Living Essential Oil. Thank you, David. Thank you, Indri. Thank you, Ibu Mora. Yeah, we're pretty sure that Thank you. we have so many experts in teams. One of them is you, David, and you are with us now, so you can explain anything related with the farm practices at this moment. And the next, ah, Ibu Atvirani. Please, Ibu. Hi, David. Terima kasih, Bu Indri. Um, mungkin aku pakai bahasa Indonesia nggak apa-apa ya. Oke, okay, I nah. would love to translate it for you, please, Ibu. Uh, David, uh, semua semoga di sana semuanya sehat-sehat saja. Um, aduh, aku gemeter <laughs> hari ini. Um, sebenarnya saya pernah ketemu David di greenhouse waktu saya silver retreat 2018 dan dan it was so amazing. Um, hari ini saya nggak mau nanya, saya cuma mau sampaikan uh, message dari tim saya. Uh, thank you, David. Terima kasih sudah uh, menjaga Lavender Farm buat kita semua. Oh my God, oh my God. I'm very touched. You know what, David? With she was in Mona in 2018 with her team, with her yeah. Don't line and, and upline also. No. So he was What's met you met in the greenhouse at that at time, time and talk and about something directly with you. And she has one lovely message. Thank you for keeping our love under farm. Thank you for maintaining everything on the right track. And Ibu Rani and her team sending so much love for you. Stay healthy, everyone who works there for our oiler community. Is that Thank true, Ibu Rani? <laughs> Thank you very much. It takes a tremendous team. Not, I have the honor to be the messenger and to be able to be with you today. But there are hundreds of employees of Young Living that are working at our farm and working at our farms all over the world. And really, we have to give every individual the credit for all of that work. And it's really an honor to be with you here today and to share. 
because everything that we do at the farms is for nothing if it were not for you, our members. Because I don't know who you know, right? I, I can't come and meet with your families and with your friends. And so I appreciate, and all of the Young Living Farm Managers and Farms appreciate everything that you do as members because you make our work effective. You enable us to arrive at every home. Thank you. Wow. Can you feel that vibration, David? Thank you, Ibu Rani. Oh. <laughs> and, and ada yang cirambe juga ya di rumah. <laughs> thank you, thank you for your lovely message, Ibu Rani. Uh, we can feel it, literally feel it. Thank you, you, David. Thank you, you, Ibu Indri. Thank you. So, who is our next guest? Hai Ibu Meta. Hai Ibu Indri, terima kasih buat kesempatannya. Hai, oke. Okay. Hai David. Hello. Hi, you really have an incredible yet challenging work there. Yeah. And thank you for bringing us for the virtual tour and the detailed explanation about your work there. I'm curious about the the Uh, regenerative organic practice you have there, especially related to this natural predator. Earlier, you mentioned about the uh, uh, what, ladybug, right? So uh -huh. did you bring the ladybug uh, to the farm or do they come naturally there? Um, both. So naturally, ladybugs live in this environment. This is where they live, they thrive. And that's part of our study at any of our farms. When we have pests, insects, weeds that we're trying to combat, we want to be careful about introducing a foreign material, even though it's organic, that might alter the local microclimate and microecosystem. So we have to select insects, predators, natural uh, to join the environment in a sustainable and in a balance of nature. And so given that the praying mantis and the ladybug are native to the Mona Utah farm, we can bring more of them to the farm to be able to help manage the predator and, and the pests that we have. Okay. So then what happened to the ladybug after they, they attack this pet, yeah, this bug? Like, so what do you, uh -huh. The ladybugs then continue to evolve. So they live their natural life there in the field. They lay eggs, they continue to move on. Because our climate is so harsh, many of the ladybugs and praying mantises die in the fall when it gets very cold but they leave their, uh, their eggs are planted either in the base of a plant or deep in the soil, and then they hatch again in the following year. There are not enough that continue to propagate that we have to add additional uh, ladybugs or praying mantises each year. Oh, wow, incredible. Because I know one of the most challenging part for an organic practice is related to these pets, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, David. Can you wait to have a young living farm in Indonesia, actually? <laughs> thank you, oh, Ibu Meta. Thank Terima you for kasih, Bu Indri. David. Yes, yes. And I guess we still have many guests. And who is the next one? Bagi yang belum tahu, di belakang David itu, it's not the background, it's the real distillation center. Ya, yeah, itu bukan background, it's the real distillation <laughs> center and it's already midnight there in Utah. And for us with love, he would love to stand there, show us and answering our question. Hai Ibu, dengan siapa ini? 
Halo Ibu Indri. Hai David. Halo. Uh, Oke, okay, I wanna asking is a okay if asking about peppermint. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in a I was a member quite long, and then sometimes, uh, not just sometimes, many times I have kind of like have a different smell about uh with a peppermint. Some peppermint is kind of like smell like have a sweetness in there, and then. Sometimes also find peppermint with smell is strong minty. So I would like to ask what is uh, making of the different smell in that peppermint? Is that because nutrition or the harvest time or the soil condition or what? <laughs> so one of the things that you'll find, and this is why with essential oils, you may be aware that a lot of times essential oils are used in the perfume industry. And because we like, you know, our, our nature is we like to have an aroma that we can, that is very, very consistent. So if I smell it today and I smell it tomorrow, it's exactly the same. And that's why so many of the essential oils on the market have gone to a synthetic essential oil. Now, why does the essential oil aroma of the peppermint oil or of any of our oils change perhaps from bottle to bottle? Is it because there are different constituents? Not necessarily. It is because each plant each year, the climatic conditions change its nature. And so it's not going to be exactly the same twice in a row. If you were to open any two bottles and they were exactly the same, that might be cause for concern, right? It, the question could arise, is this synthetic? Because it's exactly the same aroma time after time after time. Some of our plants, for example, the blue spruce, the grand fir, that's very, very consistent. Year after year after year, bottle after bottle after bottle. However, peppermint, the, uh, the compound that makes the aroma is very, uh, it fluctuates a lot by climate, by uh, the region. And so because it's natural, and that natural tendency to change, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Uh, I think, yeah, so I can understand. So, I mean, because it's a natural, so uh, mm -hmm. kind of so like not, weather also affected on the uh, drawing time or the smell of the, the peppermint, kind of like that. Yep. So okay. one of the things that we've found in order for that essential oil to be effective with my body, in order for it to speak my language and support my body's natural functions, the aroma of that essential oil doesn't have any impact on that oil's ability to support my natural wellness. What does have an impact are the specific essential oil constituents uh, and at what concentration. And so all of our essential oils go through a very rigorous testing to ensure that we have just the right amounts of each constituent in that essential oil. Seed to seal and the seed to seal standards ensure that we're able to sustainably grow the essential oil plant in a way that it can fully express its genetic expression of essential oils, that it can fully develop a full-bodied essential oil. And then when we test it, we ensure that all of the constituents are needed for it to fully uh, support our natural oils. Let me give you an example. Do we, do we have time for an example? Yeah, sure. Okay, suppose that we're in the jungle. Okay, we're gonna go to the jungle and when we get to, we're going to march through the jungle. And when we get to a ravine, there's a bridge. And we look at this bridge and we think, do we want to cross this bridge? It's a rope bridge. 
And we look and it's been there for hundreds of years. And that bridge is missing some of its supports. And some of the boards are broken or, or mossy and are about to break. Okay. And so when we go to cross it, we're concerned because if I cross this bridge and it doesn't have all the supports, am I going to make it to the other side? So we look down the ravine and we see another bridge and we go down there and that bridge has all of the support, has all of the ropes supporting the bridge and it has every board. So it's a complete bridge and it's very solid and very secure to help get us to the other side. Now I share this example because it relates to essential oils. In the industry, there are a lot of different essential oils on the market. A lot of different manufacturers of essential oil. If I don't distill the essential oil at just the right time, or just the right temperature, or, or harvest at the right time, does that mean it's not going to be peppermint essential oil? No, it's still peppermint essential oil, but it may not be effective at supporting my natural wellness. What I mean by that is it might be like the bridge that's missing some of the support. It may not enable me to bridge the gap. Essential oils help our bodies to bridge the gap of mortality. They help our bodies to function better naturally. And how that is, they bridge the, the gap to some degree. And in order for that essential oil to be effective, it has to have all of its supports. It has to have all of the constituents that are needed to meet the function of that essential oil. Aroma, while we would like it to be the same every single time and a pleasing sweet peppermint aroma, that's not one of the components of a full body of essential oil. It's not one of the constituents that are like the supports in the bridge. So as we look at seed to seal and what that standard represents, it enables us to ensure that the essential oils that we produce are full bodied, that they have all of the constituents needed to fully support our natural wellness in the way that a bridge that has all of the supports will help us to arrive at the other side in good condition. Thank you for letting me share that experience. Wow, that's wonderful. Thank you. Do you Thank have you. still? Uh, no, I think that's enough. Thank you, David, for explaining. Yeah. Thank you, Ibu. Sampai jumpa. Thank you, Bu Indri. Okay, David, if I may say, uh, great aroma with not great constituent and percentage is not great at all. Okay, then. We still have one more guest. Ha! A man! Hi, Bapak. Hello. Dengan siapa Bapak? Adian Bu. Oke, okay, silakan Bapak. Ah, uh, hello David. I have uh, two questions. Okay. The first one is uh, why blue yellow only produce uh, in Canada? Would will it be produced uh, for worldwide soon? Question. So lavender, we use the same the same genetics of our seed is used in France as we use in Utah. So the same, same plant genetics, same seed, same variety. The climate and soil do have an impact on the growth and production of the plant. However, in the case of lavender, it does not have an, Im an impact or an effect on the quality of the oil, right? So we're able to test and measure and ensure that the oil that's produced in France and the oil that's produced here in Mona all have the same essential oil constituents. In the case of our St. Mary's farm, the constituents of that lavender is just slightly different. That's in Northern Idaho. And we've kept that separate and we'll be releasing, okay, this is, this is for years only. In time, there will be a St. Mary's farm lavender that is specific to that farm. 
it still has all of the constituents that are needed to support our natural wellness, but it's just slightly different, a little bit different spectrum of essential oil constituents than the oil that is produced in France and in Utah. Mm. Okay, Bapa. So how we, just, just one thing to comment, how we get around the changes in climate and soil is through testing. Right? We have to run rigorous tests and quality control to ensure that the essential oils that we produce meet our spec, regardless of where they're grown. Bagaimana, Bapak? Sudah terjawab? Do you still have any questions? Sudah, sudah, Bu. Oke, okay. thanks, David. Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, thank you. It was... The last question from our member for you today, David. And before we close this session, I have an announcement for the winner from the last session with Nicholas. We have a quiz and there are three lavenders available as gift for three winner. So here we go. The winner for the last session with Nicholas Lendl is Apakah ada di sini? Tepuk tangannya. Boleh? Iya. Pemenangnya ada Ibu Andina, Ibu Fanina Revolis dan Ibu Anastasia Widianti. Congrats for our winners from the last session and do not worry for David session we also will have some more winners too. And David, I know it's, you know, we do not want to say goodbye with you because there are still so many questions, but the time is the limit today. But maybe we would like to hear from you some encouragement to keep the spirit for our members here. Absolutely. So if there are other questions that we did not have time to address, in today's meeting, please send those uh, questions to me in an email if we can. And so we can communicate and, and I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you have afterwards by email. So let's communicate. Again, I just want to point out a huge expression of gratitude. And the way for me that you can amplify your business and amplify the purpose of Young Living is to really focus on your why. Why you do what you do. And for me, it's everything that we do at Young Living is all about people. I think about my kids. I think about my wife and my son. I think about my friends and family, those that I care about. And I, I go and sit on a bus next to an individual that might have an ailment, right? They're not perfect. So our bodies are going to have pain and we're going to have anxiety. That's part of this life. And I recognize that that individual needs something. And we have something that we can share with them that can support their natural wellness. And I feel so inspired to develop and give so that we can reach Gary's vision to have a healthy home for each of us and a healthy world for all of us. And, and that's how we amplify our business is to focus on that passion and reach out and touch, not everyone, but touch one someone. Be someone for someone. One person at a time, and then they can reach out and touch one somebody else. And, I, and that's how it expands and grows until Young Living Essential Oils can be impactful and helpful for the natural wellness of all. Thank you for your time tonight. It's been an honor for me, and I hope to see you at one of our Young Living Farms very soon. Thank you. David, we do thank you, and we do honored by you. Then send much regards from us to you and all of the co-workers in the farm stay healthy and hopefully all of our silver leaders 
aku visit you and the farm very very soon Kakak-kakak member semua, terima kasih atas semangatnya untuk belajar hari ini di situasi yang tidak menentu cuacanya di kuningan sini. Dan uh, jangan lupa ikuti Instagram challenge-nya, post tiga hal yang paling menarik di Instagram feed masing-masing. Tersedia tiga hadiah, peppermint essential oil 15 ml untuk tiga pemenang. Ah, berat sekali rasanya berpisah, but thank you and bye-bye Indonesia!